A couple months back, um, right as COVID and quarantine had started, I found myself becoming increasingly discouraged. And to be honest, a lot of that came from uh, this sense of not knowing what to do. And so I found myself uh, looking at and investigating what are the, what are other churches doing um, during this time. And I was on a Zoom call with a bunch of other pastors and a guy named John Tyson, who pastors in New York City, uh, had this statement where he said, everyone's asking how the church should respond. And he said, I think that's the wrong question. And the question we should be asking is, what is God saying? And when he said that, it was like peace just flooded my heart. That I was asking the wrong question. I was chasing after maybe a strategy or something that would um, kind of steer us in the right direction. And I realized in that moment, it, I needed to go back to just abiding in Christ, to listening to him, not only for me, but for our church. And that statement has stuck with me uh, during the whole time. And so I have keenly tried to attune my ear to what God is saying. And recently I was having a conversation with a friend and there was another statement that it's just like, it's almost like God's highlighting for me. And my friend mentioned that he believed that God was uh, re awakening and re-identifying the church's identity as a royal priesthood. Now, if that term royal priesthood sounds foreign and strange, um, that's totally fine. I'm, I'm going to spend the next few minutes unpacking that uh, because the idea of priesthood, I really believe is something that we have a moment right now as Light Church, um, as the capital C Church to really ask those questions. God, how do we reclaim our identity as a church right now when so many things that were normal, so many things that had become traditions, so many things that have become ritualistic have been removed. It gives us a greater sense to evaluate our substance and our identity. And when my friends said that, it just rung so true in my heart. And so we're actually going to be uh, focusing on Psalm 110 which is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. 26 times Psalm 110 is quoted, multiple times by Jesus. Specifically this phrase about a high priest. And so uh, as we get ready to do that, we're gonna actually be looking at a lot of scripture. So if you have a Bible somewhere laying around your house, this might be a good sermon just to grab that. Uh, if you're taking notes, uh, we're going to be covering a lot of ground today. Uh, and I don't want you guys to, to miss it as we kind of fly through these different things, because I believe this is a huge concept and even a prophetic moment for our church to realize what is God asking of us? What is he speaking to us? So before I begin, I'm just going to go ahead and pray. Um, and then I'll give you a chance to kind of settle down, grab a Bible, some notes. And we're just going to walk through what does it look like for God to help us reimagine our calling as a royal priesthood. So Father, we thank you for this opportunity, wherever we are, to gather not only in front of a screen, but to gather in the presence of the Holy Spirit, the living God. And Lord, thank you that you can meet us where we are. Um, Lord, even if this is recorded a few days before someone's watching it, Lord, you have the power and ability to meet every individual in a profound way. So we're asking that you would do that today. God, we're asking that your identity, your purpose, God, your vision for your church and our local church would be realized at a greater level today. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, in order for us to uh, understand what I'm talking about, about regaining our purpose as a royal priesthood, we have to kind of look at the greater narrative arc of Scripture. And so the best place to start of the story is in the beginning. So the opening uh, page of scripture is a poem. It's an ancient Hebrew poem that describes the birthing and the creation of the world around us. And what the poet is doing is he's actually describing in sequence this well laid out garden 
Now, what we find later on in, in Jewish, uh, the Jewish scriptures is that this garden is later replicated in the temple, meaning that Moses and the authors that created the first five books of the Bible that describe the temple, knowing what the temple was, opened up scripture talking about a garden that resembles their temple. And so, if you will, we open to this cosmic garden type temple. And in this place, what we see is the presence of God dwelling in beauty and perfection. And we're introduced to the first person. <clears throat> and that person has a job to tend and to attend the garden, the creation that God has created. And so a lot of times we, we look at it for science. So when was the world created? Things like that. But for the Jewish mind, the ancient Jewish mind, this would have brought uh, imagery and metaphor of the temple they would have worshipped at. Images of a river, um, the images of, of, of gold, the images that they would have been familiar with. Like, oh yeah, we know what this is. And so, although the word priest is not used yet, um, they understand that Adam is fulfilling a priestly role in a cosmic temple in the garden. And so what happens is we, the first priest we're introduced to is a guy named Melchizedek. He's kind of this obscure character that keeps coming up throughout scripture. But the next point we see this idea of a priest or a priesthood, a collection of priests, is in Exodus 19. At this point, God had called a family, Abraham and his family, to create the nation that he would call to his own and he would use that nation of Israel to bless the entire world. But in order to do that, he rescues them under the oppression of Egypt. And so he calls them out of Egypt into the desert. And as they're in the desert, he gives them an identity because their entire identity has been wrapped up in slavery. It's been wrapped up in oppression. It's been wrapped up in pain. And so in this giving of identity, listen to what he says in Exodus 19, verse three, it says, then Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possessions. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be, for me, here it is, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. So here is this identityless nation, rescue brought to a desert, and God tells Moses, I want you to tell them, you are a nation of priests, a holy people. So keep that in mind. We're, in, we're opening up with this imagery of a garden that resembles a temple. And then we see the people of God and God says, you are a people of a royal priesthood. Next, what we see is that um, we see this in Psalm 110, the Psalm that we're focusing on today, there's an obscure verse, verse four says, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, this is a verse that's quoted multiple times in the New Testament referring to Jesus. And so, 100 years after God's rescued Israel from Egypt, under the rule and reign of David, there comes this prophecy that a priest is coming. Well, there's also, so we have this, this identity of they're going to be a nation of priests. And then what happens is that they fail to live up to that identity of a holy people of living as a priesthood. And so what we find is because of that failure, they're brought into, part of it is they're brought into exile, they're longing to come back. And so in Nehemiah chapter nine, listen to what it says is, our kings, our leaders, our priests, and our ancestors did not follow your law. They did not pay attention to your commandments or your statutes warned them to keep even while they were in their kingdom, enjoying your great goodness to them in the spacious and fertile land you gave them, they did not serve you or turn their eyes from evil ways. And so you have this opening scene, this amazing commission. You are a royal priesthood. There's a promise of a future priest to come. But what we see ultimately is a failure to step into that identity. And so then there comes this new hope. In the book of Ezra, we see a priest 
coming and starts restoring the priestly festivals and the sacrifices and everything that you think of with the priest, Ezra begins to do. And so the readers of the Old Testament began to stir up hope of like, oh, that we're going to regain our calling. But what's interesting is the story of Ezra and Nehemiah ends with, you guessed it, failure to live into the identity of being a priesthood. Listen to the last few verses of Nehemiah chapter 13 says, Remember then my God, because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood of Levites. So the old, and this is kind of the last narrative book of the Old Testament. And so you're kind of left with kind of this anti-climax of God calling this, this people to himself. You will be a nation of priests. By the way, priests represent God to people and people to God. It's this high calling in God's eyes. And we see them kind of ascribe to it and they fail. And then we see kind of hope, well, maybe they're going to get it this time. And then they fail. And then we, the, the Old Testament just ends. And then Jesus comes. And Jesus comes. And in Hebrews 4, it identifies what he came to do and who he came to be. Now, again, this is just one theme woven through all of Scripture, but it's an important one. Hebrews 4 says this, Therefore, since we now have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we pro profess. For we did not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So this is huge. Jewish, and if, you're, if I'm losing, you stick with me here. This is where it starts to all tie together. Like every ancient religion, in order to approach their God, you had to have a mediator, which was a priest. You had to have someone who would talk to God for you and to you from that God. And Israel is no different. Their priests were also called Levites and they had this high status in society. But God in the beginning says, you're supposed to be a whole nation of priests. And we see a failed attempt at that. So when Jesus comes, what does he call? The new high priest. And as the new high priest, it's not only a restored hope because now he stands between us and God as our mediator, as our intercessor, making, making us right with God, which is, which is such a beautiful element of the gospel, but, but it gets better. In Peter, one of Jesus' disciples' letter to the church, listen to what he says about us. He says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into wonderful light. Does this ring any bells? He's quoting uh, Exodus, the call that was originally given to Israel out of the desert that was failed to keep. Jesus comes as a high priest and then he allows, he invites us as followers of Jesus. We are now this nation of priests, meaning we don't need a human being to, to intercede on our behalf because we have Jesus as our high priest, which now has allowed all of us. I mean, think, think about this. We're a nation of priests, royal priesthood belonging to God, that we stand in the full presence of God, but we also are living in the world. We live in this in-between space. And listen to what verse 10 says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Which is the same way the Hebrews 4 ends. So what does Jesus being the high priest mean? It means we can receive mercy. What does it mean that we're a royal priesthood? It means that we can receive mercy. Okay, so let's, let's tie all this together. We've kind, of, we've kind of walked over the entire of scripture and the theme of priesthood in like five minutes. So the question is, what do you mean by reclaiming our identity as a royal priest? Well, there's, there's three things I'd like for you, us to consider today. Number one, it's our attention. Number two, it's our intercession. And number three, it's our reception and receiving. 
Let's just walk through these three responses to this call that we now live as the royal priesthood. Number one it has to do with our attention. Um, John Tyson, who I mentioned earlier, has this amazing quote. He says, attention leads to adoration. Distraction leads to disillusionment. And so what we're seeing right here is that to be a, a to reclaim our identity as a priesthood has to do with attending to the presence of God. And think about the word attention and attending. It's this idea of awareness that what we give our attention to ultimately will get our adoration. But what distracts us will create disillusionment. And so I think the very first thing of what it looks like to reclaim our identity as a royal priesthood begins with our attentiveness to God. Are we practicing the presence of God, like Brother Lawrence said? Are we abiding in, in Christ, what Jesus famously said in John 15? Is, this, is there this connectedness that now that we have access once again to the presence of God, in, I mean, I'm thinking, of, and the reason why I'm preaching this in our church right now is so oftentimes we associate coming to a church building with the presence of God. We're a royal priesthood. We have access to the presence of God everywhere we go. And so really it's not about location or geography anymore. It's about attentiveness and awareness. Are we continuing to practice the presence of God as a royal priesthood right now? And this, I believe, is central and one of the benefits, honestly, of having not gathered for about six months is we've had to really take inventory of our own hearts of how are we doing keeping God at the forefront of our minds and hearts. And I would encourage you, if, if that has been a struggle for you, uh, if, if having ongoing conversation and ongoing awareness of the goodness and presence of God has been a struggle for you, you're not alone. But it also means that this is going to take a reclaiming of our identity. We're a royal priesthood. As, as a royal priesthood, we cannot lose our attentiveness to God's presence. So Dallas Willard um, has this beautiful uh, grid of how we change, of how we transform. So what does it look like for us to gain uh, a greater attention and attentiveness to the presence of God? And his acronym is, is VIM. It's a vision, intention, and means. So vision is what we're doing right now. It's just waking us up and opening up our eyes. Okay, we desperately need to have a greater awareness of the presence of God. And that vision needs to constantly be renewed. But the next thing that needs to happen uh, has to do with intentions. And intention has to do with the value we need to commit to something. And so it's not just enough to be like, yeah, it's a, it's a good idea. You know, Benji talked on this video that we should be, you know, attentive to God's presence. But now we have to have the intention to do it. It's this decisive moment of saying, okay, this, this is not just a good idea. This is not just a vision. I have an intention in my heart to do this. And last thing is M, it, it's means. So it's not enough just to have a vision of of attending to the presence of God. And it's not even enough to have this intention. Oh, I'm going to do it. As, I mean, has anyone ever had a good intention that did not go well? Because you have to have the means. And so what that looks like, honestly, it looks like rhythms. It looks like focus. It looks like aligning your life in such a way that you can attend to the presence of God um, in, a, in a purposeful, renewed way. Way. So that's just the first thing. It's, it's our attention needs to be renewed. Second um, is our intercession. One of my favorite images of Jewish priests is that they have these 12 stones on the breastplate um, of the priestly garment. And these 12 stones represent the 12 tribes of Israel because they want them close to their heart. This is found in Exodus 28. It's given as instruction by God. This is what you are to wear. And so I just can't help but think that if we're to reclaim our identity as a royal priesthood, what would it look like to carry the names of others on our heart? 
What would it look like to carry the name of our city on our heart? What would it look like for us to carry our nation and our world on our heart? I mean, with our 24 hour news cycle, social media, we are constantly being exposed to um, horrific things that are demanding of justice and healing in our world. But we can either choose to become disillusioned or apathetic or maybe um, outraged or we can carry these things close to our heart as a royal priesthood and begin to intercede and to pray and to act justly in such a way that brings about God's redemptive purposes as his royal priesthood. And so what would that look like? Just three quick things. Originally those stones were names of actual people. Those names of actual people turned to tribes, and a tribe turned to a nation. And so I just want to think of that grid. Who are names you can carry on your heart right now as you're watching this? Who are people God is asking you to carry on your heart, to pray for them, to intercede in your priestly identity for people? Um, second is this idea of a, of a tribal thing. And what if we spent more time praying for our city and our government and our nation than we did researching or complaining. What, what if we spent a, a, a significant amount of time interceding and, and we carry that on our heart, no, no matter what your political persuasion or what your ideology is, um, do you carry it on your heart? Does it lead you to intercession? And lastly, that those nations that were on the priest's heart were meant to bless the world. Um, uh, seeing the tragedy that happened this week in Lebanon, and it, it should break our heart. Not, and, and the fact that it's half a world away, there should be a certain amount that we carry that. Now, every person, please hear me, is unique and different. You can't look at what you're carrying on your heart and compare it to the person next to you. You cannot judge what someone else is carrying or feel like they should be carrying what you're carrying. No, no, no you. What is God asking you to carry on your heart as a royal priesthood to intercede through your attentiveness and adoration of him? Thirdly, is this idea of our reception or receptivity. I love that Hebrews 4, talking about Jesus as our high priest, and 1 Peter 2, talking about us as a, a royal priesthood, both end with this statement, for us to receive mercy. For us to reclaim our identity as a royal priesthood, it's not enough just to attend to the presence of God. It's not enough just to intercede for others and for our nation and for our world. It means that we have to posture ourselves in a specific and intentional way. What? To receive. You see, before we can do, before we can express, before we can act, according to 1 John chapter 4, we can't even love until we've first received love from Him. We have to receive God's mercy if we are to be a people and a priesthood of mercy. So please, I implore you, would you posture your heart today, wherever you are watching this, to take inventory of who you are, not just the good stuff, but the bad stuff, the stuff that these past six months have unearthed in you, your insecurity or your fear, your anxiety, your depression, patterns of sin, or whatever seems to be coming to the surface and you're like, I don't really like that. Let it surface and let God's mercy come and, and, and rest upon it. Uh, Thomas Merton says this, but the man who is not afraid to admit everything that he sees to be wrong with himself, and yet recognizes that he may be the object of God's love precisely because of his shortcomings, can begin to be sincere. His sincerity is based on confidence, not in his own illusions about himself, listeners, but in the endless, unfailing mercy of God. One last story before we close. Uh, this week, we, uh, Jen initiated a garage overhaul and so we uh, spent three full days clearing out our garage and we finally got it to like the best it's ever been. 
and I walked to the garage the next morning to enjoy the glory of the goodness of our garage. And Augustine is standing there, and he has the door shut behind him, and he says, oh, Dad, you shouldn't, don't go in there. And I was like, why? And he says, oh, dude, just don't go. And I said, I'm like, Augustine, tell me the truth. He's like, um, I made a mess. So we walk in, he had taken a brand new bottle, large bottle of Elmer's glue, and he had walked around the entire garage and had put it on um, our desks, on skateboards, on boxes, on a ping pong table. It was everywhere. And if you know me, you know that I have this thing that I hate, stuff that's sticky. And I'm looking at this mess. And I'm looking at my son who just told me the truth. And I realize I have this opportunity to respond in my flesh or I can respond in my reclaimed identity as a priesthood of God. And I chose in that moment, not always, to respond with mercy. So I invited my son to get a washcloth and I took a bucket, literally a bucket of soapy water and we cleaned that whole space. But by we, it was me. At the end of that, my son had smeared some glue, but as his father, I cleaned up every single surface that he had dirty. And in that moment, I'm washing my hands and guess what I'm wearing? Glue all over me, on my pants and on my hands. What, what a picture of what our Heavenly Father does as our, uh, Jesus has done as our High Priest. He's extended mercy. He's taken an accurate look into the mess we've made. And what does he extend? Mercy. What does he do? He takes on our mess upon himself. 2 Corinthians 5 talks about that he became sin for us. He wears that so that we could become the righteousness of God. My son did not accurately clean up what the mess he had made, but because of the mercy of his, of his father, he had no idea. He was invited into the work of the father but he was not accountable for the actions that he was responsible for because of mercy. Listen, if we're to reclaim our identity as a royal priesthood, we have to receive the mercy of the Heavenly Father that comes through Jesus Christ. And he extends that to you today. And I hope that you would position yourself to receive just that. But it begins with receiving so that we can attend to the presence of God intercede for others and receive God's mercy and by reclaiming our identity as a royal priesthood I think that the church will continue to be unstoppable no matter what comes in the weeks and months and years to come because God has made a way through Jesus Christ for us to walk in our identity that has always been ours let me pray for you Heavenly Father thank you that when our traditions and rituals and rhythms feel disrupted, that our identity is not. That Jesus, because you came as our high priest, because you gave us the identity as a royal priest of Lord Jesus, that we can move in this season to be attentive to your presence, to intercede for others, Lord, and ultimately to be receiving mercy. We desperately need it. So God, I'm asking that you would just continue uh, to just meet every single person as they're watching this, wherever they are, in a real and profound way. God, I pray that as your church reclaims their identity as a priesthood, that without a pastor in front of them, uh, without a, a church building to go to, Lord, your purposes have not changed. Your church is unstoppable, Lord God. Your kingdom will advance. Help us to walk in this renewed sense of identity and calling for Jesus. I love you so much in Jesus' name. Amen.